Jesus taught us to love our enemies. And there may be people in your life with whom you have just had enough. You've washed your hands of them and you've thought to hell with you. But brothers and sisters, we must love our enemies, even pray for our enemies, as Paul does here. Thank you for listening to me today. And I wanted to start this morning uh, by saying that I miss you all. I miss seeing you on Sunday mornings and I felt separated from you uh, over the past few weeks. It's true that social distancing and isolating does impact our relationship, doesn't it? But Jesus is with us in spirit uh, and we are still part of his body. I look forward to that time when we will be able to gather together physically uh, once again. For now, all I get to be is a recorded video uh, bringing God's word to you this morning. Well, let me read to you from Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. Over the next nine weeks, we're going to be working our way through chapters 9 to 11 uh, of the letter to the Romans. Uh, Maybe that will see us through this isolation period, maybe. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through to 5. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. Well, before we get into the details uh, of this text, let me explain where we were up, where we we're up to in this uh, letter of Paul's to the Romans. Paul has explained how salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. And he sa- as he says in chapter 3, Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. And the only way to be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ who died for our sins. But here is the problem, the problem that Paul has been grappling with the whole way through the letter uh, to the Romans. The Jews had been given the law of Moses, and they thought that if they obeyed it, then they would be saved. And now Paul was saying, that's not good enough for God. You're not good enough for God. So all of their law keeping, Uh, The circumcision, the food restrictions, the Sabbath rules, all of this was no use in making them right with God. Paul was even saying that the Jews were not saved. They are not right with God just because they are Jews. At the end of this chapter, chapter 9, Paul says that the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness, have not attained their goal. Now, you and I would say, well, that's the gospel, and that's fair enough. Salvation through faith by grace alone is the gospel. But Paul was a Jew, and this was a major problem for him. To help us to understand how Paul felt, how the Jews felt, Imagine if you, as a Christian, got to Judgment Day and you stood before the judgment seat of Christ and he says it's not enough that you have admitted your sins, believed in my death and resurrection and committed to living with me as your Lord. To get into my new creation, 
you had to be more joyful. You're just not happy enough for me to let you in. And to your protest, if you said, but Lord, you died and rose from the dead and your word said that all had, I had to do was repent and believe, Jesus would say, but didn't you see the hints in my word? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Your joy will be made complete. These are things that my word says. You are supposed to be happy and you weren't. Now you'd be surprised and you'd probably be feeling betrayed by God because God would seem to have been untrustworthy and unfaithful. Well, that's how the Jews felt about the gospel of Jesus Christ. What was the point of their previous way of life, following the law, offering the sacrifices, reading the Old Testament, if in fact it was salvation through grace by faith alone. If that was true, then God seemed unfaithful and untrustworthy. Now, this is not just a problem for Jews. For if the Jews didn't benefit from the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, then how is God going to treat us? You see, most Jews don't believe in Jesus. And so most Jews are not saved. And yet the Old Testament is full of sayings about how great it is to be one of God's chosen people. God promises peace, prosperity, and even dominion over the world to the Jews. If that hasn't happened for the Jews, neither for the Jews of the 20th century nor the Jews of the 1st century, what does that say about God's promises to us? If God has been unfaithful in his promises to them, then how can we really trust him when it counts, when we meet him on Judgment Day? What if God changes the goalposts once again? Doesn't this confuse you? It concerns me. Most of the world's 25 million Jews do not believe in Jesus Christ. They share the whole of the Old Testament with Christians, but according to the gospel, it's of no use to them. Hasn't God been inconsistent with the Old Testament? Well, in these chapters of Romans, Paul seeks to defend the gospel and God himself against the charge of being inconsistent with the Old Testament and untrustworthy regarding the Jews. And this is highly relevant for us. If we're going to spend our lives depending upon the rock who is Jesus Christ, we need to make sure that that rock doesn't turn out to be paper mache, that we're not left standing before the throne of God and judged according to other criteria other than grace alone through faith alone. In the remainder of our time this morning, I will look firstly at verses 1 through to 3, where Paul professes his own love for the Jews. And then at verses 4 and 5, where Paul restates this problem, Israel's rejection of Jesus. Well, let's read verses 1 through to 3, the beginning of verse 4, uh, once again. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, my own race, the people of Israel. Now you may or may not know that today most Jews uh, think of Paul as the arch enemy of the Jewish race that his writings have dishonoured the law and sowed the seeds of modern anti-Semitism. They don't blame Jesus, they blame Paul. They hate Paul. And it was really no different 
in, G- in Paul's day. The Jews really did hate him. Only months into his first missionary journey through modern day Turkey, it was the Jews who surrounded Paul and pelted him with stones until they thought he was dead. Perhaps, like the Jews of today, the Jews back then thought that Paul hated them, and so they hated him back. I worked for a while as a warehouse supervisor in my late 20s. I was responsible for 18 or so store women and store men, and emotionally, it was the most difficult job that I have ever had mostly because I was in management and the workers thought that I couldn't be trusted. One guy in particular hated my guts, it seemed to me, and he made life very difficult for me. He thought that I was victimising him, and so uh, he hated me. He thought I was making him work harder than other people. This wasn't true, uh, but he genuinely thought Uh, that I was treating him badly. On one particularly trying day, all I did was look over in his direction from a distance of maybe 20 metres away, and immediately he walked off the job and walked into my manager's office and complained uh, that I was harassing him. He thought that I hated him, and so he hated me back. The Jews of Jesus' day thought that Paul hated them as a race and that he hated their religion. Now, Paul wanted the Jews to trust in Jesus, and so he didn't want them thinking that he hated them. So he begins his chapter in this way. In verse 3, Paul says, I could wish that I myself were cursed. Now, this wish uh, is a desperate desire not simply a vague hope. Someone today might say, I wish we had a cure for COVID-19. Paul was that desperate to be cursed for the sake of his own people, the Jews. In fact, uh, the original word for wish is the same word that's often translated pray in the New Testament. So Paul prayed that his own salvation would be taken away in exchange for the salvation of the Jews. Paul's attitude towards the Jews is the exact opposite of hatred. He wanted to give up his own salvation, to be cursed, to be cut off from Jesus and uh, sent to eternal damnation for their sake. That's love, isn't it? Sacrificial love, the kind of love that Jesus also showed upon the cross. Paul's concern for his Jewish brothers and sisters was such that his heart ached continuously, as he says in verse 2. He had great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. This also reminds me of Jesus. Uh, when he wept over Jerusalem before the last time that he entered the city. There's a very important lesson for us here. Paul was trying to defend the gospel, his message of salvation, against the accusation of being inconsistent and untrustworthy. He could easily have given up on those who opposed him, who rejected his message, He could have said here in this letter to the Romans, to hell with the Jews. They hate Jesus and they hate me. I wash my hands of them. But instead, he professed his love for them. As Christians, we can too easily give up on those who hate us or those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, who say that our beliefs are foolish or stupid, to treat them as enemies because they hate us in some way. A few weeks ago, when we were still allowed to approach people in public, a few of us from BMAC uh, approached uh, a man from another religion. 
Now, the views that he expressed were typical of that religion, and he was so offensive to Jesus and so arrogant in his own conviction that I walked away very tempted just to give up on that kind of person. This wasn't the first time that I've had this kind of conversation uh, with such a person. And I almost thought in my own heart, well, stuff them. They don't want to listen about Jesus. So I'm not going to try and talk to that kind of person anymore. There's plenty of other people to speak to. I'm not going to waste my time. But Paul would never have done that. Jesus would never have done that. Jesus taught us to love our enemies. And there may be people in your life with whom you have just had enough. You've washed your hands of them and you've thought to hell with you. But brothers and sisters, we must love our enemies, even pray for our enemies as Paul does here. Well, in verses 4 and 5, Paul, having laid bare his heart regarding the fate of the Jews, explained why he was in so much anguish. Let's read verses 4 and 5. The people of Israel, theirs is the adoption to sonship, theirs is a divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It was not just that Paul was a Jew, and they're Jews, and so he feels anguish for them. Paul was uh, not simply being nationalistic or tribal. Uh, not that there would be anything wrong with that. Uh, many of you have a strong sense of responsibility and love for Indonesians. You want Indonesians to trust in Jesus, and, and that is a good thing. But for Paul, this was something a little bit different. Paul's anguish came out of their, the Jews already existing national relationship with God. God had chosen the patriarchs. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then chosen all of Jacob's descendants to be his own children. Theirs is the adoption to sonship, the verse says. God had also said that his glory would live in the temple, and so theirs is the divine glory. He also made agreements with them through Moses and King David, and so theirs are the covenants. They had the law, the temple, the promises and the bloodline from the patriarchs to the Messiah. God himself, Jesus, the son of God, had been born into their race as a human being. From them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, of the Messiah, who is God over all. So this wasn't simply a family of people in which Paul was an estranged son. This was the nation that the God of the universe had chosen and revealed himself to for, for the last 2,000 years. And yet, according to what Paul knew from Jesus, the Messiah, they were not saved. They were as lost as any sun-worshipping, human-sacrificing Aztec. It is... A tragedy to Paul, a national shame that the Jews had rejected Jesus. It's like our prime minister having his bag searched for drugs if he enters another country. Shameful. Israel was the chosen son. So where were the privileges that they were entitled to? Now, I'm not going to resolve that issue, that problem for you this morning. Paul is only in these verses stating his love for Israel uh, and laying out the tragedy of their situation. And I hope that I've given you a good background uh, for the next three chapters. Uh, what I hope I have done this morning 
is to give you an idea of the importance of the Old Testament. Uh, you cannot just read the New Testament, which dates from the time of Jesus, and ignore what God had been doing with Israel for thousands of years beforehand. Two thirds of the Bible is the Old Testament. When you explain the gospel to a non-Christian, where do you start? You start with creation, uh, which is detailed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament gives the background and the foundation of the New Testament. Jesus' death on the cross as the sacrifice for our sins makes little sense without the Old Testament. In fact, the whole of the Old Testament points towards Jesus. So as we work our way through Romans chapters 9 to 11, I have a challenge for you. No, I'm not going to ask you to read the whole of the Old Testament. If you want an extra challenge, go ahead and do that. My challenge is just for you to read the first five books of the Bible. Genesis uh, begins, it's a real page turner, and Exodus is a great narrative read up until chapter 20, and after that it's pretty much all direct quotes from God. Why wouldn't you want to read that? So how about you sit down and read those five books by the time you get out of isolation. You see, in this history with Israel, God was revealing and proving his character. As you read the Old Testament, your picture of God will be filled out and given definition. Is God fair? Is God trustworthy? Is God consistent? Well, yes, he is. The problem is with people, not with God himself. But still, God welcomes these questions simply by allowing this history to be written down by the Jews. God says in the pages of the Old Testament, examine me, test me, know me. He is a good God who loves all people, especially his chosen people, the Jews. For us to have an unshakable belief in him and in his goodness, we need to read how he has interacted with people in history. And this is what the Old Testament does for us, along with pointing us towards Jesus. So brothers and sisters at Bike, love your enemies and read your Old Testament. There's a challenge for you in the weeks ahead. Amen.